Hey guys, coming to you from a new construction job site here in Austin, Texas. My company is just about to start framing on this brand new house being built. And this is a slab on grade foundation. That means that the concrete right here is poured right on top of the ground and then the house will get framed on top of that. There's no basement, there's no crawl space under here. Now this is probably the most common foundation on new homes being built in Texas in about the last 20 or so years. However, there's another type of foundation you also might want to consider for your new house. That's a pier and beam foundation. On the build show today, we're going to take a deep dive on the differences between slab on grade and pier and beam foundations. We're going to talk about the pros and cons and which one might be right for your new build. It's almost 100 outside today though, so instead of filming this at the job, I'm going to meet you back at the office and we'll film it there. Let's get going. All right guys, it was hot on the job site, so thanks for letting me come back to the office here. We're gonna take a deep dive today on two different types of foundations that are pretty common in the south, but you also see these in the Pacific Northwest and some of the southeastern states as well. You're not gonna see slabs or pier and beams typically though in the real cold climates. This is gonna be a little bit more of a temperate climate foundation. So first off, let's take a look at slab foundations. Now this is a, a job in South Austin that I completed not too long ago. And we actually did a full in-ground foundation. So if you're in the north, this is probably more like what you're used to seeing. These are uh, you know, somewhere between eight and 10 foot, maybe even deeper basement walls where you've got concrete walls all the way down. But one of the main reasons why we don't do slabs in Texas in particular is this right here. This is that, that same foundation backed up to when we were doing excavation. If you look at the soil conditions here, we've got maybe just a couple of three or four inches of actual topsoil. And then in this case, we had about three to four feet of clay. And then from this line on down, that's nothing but solid rock. So for us to put a foundation in, it was a bear. We had a ton of this right here, which is excavation with a hoe ram. This basically is a an, a hammer on the end of a pneumatic tool that's gonna hammer down tut, 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 and pop that rock out. And you can see it came out in little pieces. That took us a ton of time to actually put that foundation in the ground. So let's talk about slabs first. As I mentioned on the intro, it's probably the most common foundation for Southern US homes is a slab on grade. Relatively straightforward to understand, but let me walk you through it anyways, just to make sure we're both on the same page. Here's a slab on grade foundation. You can see we're basically at grade here at the garage section. But then as you go downhill here, at the very end, we were probably three to four feet maybe out of the ground on this section of the slab. And the living section is on this right hand side here. The slab has been polished relatively smooth. And one of the nice things about slab foundations is that you can actually use that structural slab as your finished floor. You see a lot of tile on southern U.S. homes, even Texas homes, because we've got that concrete you can tile right onto. But you could actually just polish this, grind it, put a sealer on it, whatever you want, and you've got a finished floor there. Now, one of the things I like about slabs right away is this. It's an incredibly durable foundation. If it's done right, there's really hardly anything that can go wrong with a slab. That being said, I will talk about some issues here in a little bit. But slabs are very solid, generally speaking, a very uh, excellent foundation because of lack of movement and changes compared to other types. Okay, so here's, let's back up a little bit on the process in the slab. These are the guys that are actually placing a slab I did a couple years ago. You see we've got a, a truck and we've got a uh, concrete pump pumping it down. It's usually all poured monolithically, meaning all poured at one time. Now production builders use a specific type of slab called a post-tension slab. Now we're gonna get into the specifics. And there's two main types of slab on grade foundations, post-tension and a rebar slab. So for instance, on this house that I was visiting, one of the telltale signs, hopefully you can see it on this picture here, is you're gonna see these little marks right here on the foundation. And they're like a little pock mark that's gotten parged over or stuccoed over. And that's a real big telltale sign that you've actually got a post-tension slab. Now here's what that looked like prior to pour. You can see you've got a cable on here. That's a post-tensioning cable. 
These are cables that can take a massive amount of pressure. And what happens is they lay the cables loose on the slab. The slab is poured and then later they bring a device on there that's actually going to pull the cable. It actually is pushing against the concrete and pulling those cables. They're tensioned post after the, uh, after the fact. That's why they call it a post tension slab. And what happens is the slab, once those, those cables are tensioned, the whole slab is kind of holding together because of these cables. Now that's a good way to go if you want to minimize cracking and that's why production builders like it. But one of the big downsides of a post tension slab is if you do any work later and you happen to cut one of those tensioning cables, it's a really, really big deal to fix it. And if you had a problem with one of those cables during construction, again, really, really big deal. Okay, so instead of that, let me show you my preference when it comes to slab on grade. And this is actually all I've ever built with in the last 15 years. Now we're kind of working our way back on this. Here's that same slab earlier, and now you're gonna see what I like, which is a rebar slab. And here's what that's gonna look like pre-pour. What's happening is you've got a grid through the slab of beams. These are at varying depth depending on what the soil engineer tells us to do. But then they're gonna put a grid work of rebar inside the beams, and those beams are crossing each other. And then there's also a rebar grid that happens on the top part of the slab. The slab itself in the field here on top of this vapor barrier, this area is typically four to five inches deep. And then these beams, you may see those as shallow as maybe 18 inches to as much as maybe 36 or even deeper. And then usually there's a perimeter beam. Now there also may be some additional supports underneath that slab. And in this case, it's, you can't really tell, but this is actually a steel pile supported slab. So we're building right here on the lake. We had uh, some serious amount of piles. Now here's one of the things that I don't like about slab foundations. They are incredibly hard to upgrade and repair. This is my friend's house. They was complaining of some sewer smell in their bathroom uh, six months or so after the contractor finished his bathroom remodel. And with a little investigation work, I realized, oh my gosh, he doesn't have a pee trap on this shower. And so those sewer gases were coming right up through the shower. And the only thing you can do, of course, is jackhammer that out. And it's a lot of work to do a remodel, to do an upgrade, to do a repair on any plumbing that's in a, that's in a slab. Check out what else I saw inside this uh, slab when I pulled it out. This is not the point of the video, but that totally shocked me. I couldn't believe uh, what I was seeing in there. Some flex pipe, obviously not meant to be buried and was totally buried. Turns out this, this uh, remodel project got no permits and they made a lot of errors. We ended up uncovering a bunch of things that we had to fix for my friend. But slab on grades often will have this type of repair done to them. This is a after the fact leveling where a company came out, they, they basically punched a bunch of holes in the slab in various places. They'll put a jack underneath a beam and they'll jack it up so that they can repair that foundation. Very hard to do, very invasive. Man, it's just, it's brutal on the house and the homeowner. So that's one big downside of slab foundations. Let's fast forward a little bit through these photos in the interest of time. Here's just a few more under constructions from various slabs I've done over the years. And let's take a look at, oh, actually this photo I do wanna mention. Let's see if I can go back. Sorry, y'all. This is a great shot. This is a drone shot from one of those earlier uh, slabs that I was talking about on the lake. So this is taken from you know 150 feet or so above the house. The yellow that you're seeing there is a vapor barrier. That's a product by Stego that I like to use. It's gonna keep groundwater and soil moisture from getting that slab wet. And that's all the way even underneath my slab. It's also taped where I have seams. And then you can start to get a feel for that rebar grid that's throughout there. And then as I mentioned on, on this house, everywhere there's an intersection, there's a steel pile that the pile guys drove all the way down to rock. So in effect, this slab on grade is kind of like a house at the uh, ocean that's up on piers and in between the bottom of the slab and the rock, which in this case was 50 feet down, we've got some really bad soil with some potential for movement or change. So we basically pinned the house with those piles all the way down to rock. The last thing I wanna mention about slab foundations that I really like is that there's no water issues. I mentioned that we have a uh, Stego vapor barrier underneath this house. You have no basement, you have no crawl space. There's really no basement waterproofing that needs to happen on a slab on grade. Uh, 
Another reason why production builders like them, and frankly so do I, there's no pests, there's no critters, there's no raccoons under your house. When that house is on a slab on grade, you've got a firm foot on the house that's sitting right on the ground and there's no issues with water, pests, all that other kind of stuff. Okay, now let's switch and take a look at pier and beam foundations. So in this case, this house actually had a perimeter beam, but oftentimes you'll just see these right here. This is a pier that's been poured, and then the guys are gonna put a sauna tube on that. He's actually vibrating that at the end to make sure that that concrete uh, is gonna be nice and um, aerated, or we're getting the air bubbles out of that. You can see there's a rebar cage in this case that's going down uh, into the earth. And in this case, we actually had to drill down until we hit rock, so we went pretty far down. Then he's gonna level that off and we're gonna pull those forms off. And here's that foundation as we're getting ready for framing. Now again, this, is, this blue that you see here is gonna end up being a vapor barrier. So we've actually taped that to our piers here and we've run it up the sides of that perimeter beam on the outside. But what's gonna happen that you're gonna see in a minute here is we're gonna bring our framing and it's gonna sit on top of these and form that grid work of the house on top. Okay, so I, I skipped a step here. On top of the blue vapor barrier, in this case, we poured a small slab, which was basically a concrete uh, sidewalk, just a couple inches thick, no rebar, just a mesh down there, so that when we finish this pier and beam house, we're gonna have a really nice crawl space. And you'll notice that perimeter beam that's running all the way around the outside, that's gonna form, for this house, a conditioned crawl space. Now there's two types of crawl spaces, a vented and an unvented crawl space. This will be an unvented crawl space, which in effect is a short basement. Again, we've got rock, we've got all kinds of other uh, reasons in Texas why we don't need foundations. Also, we have a very shallow frost line. In fact, most parts of Texas don't have any frost line whatsoever. So as a result, we don't need to dig down. And so this crawl space is gonna end up acting like a short basement on the house. And here's what it looks like just before we start the framing. Uh, sorry, I've got my photos out of order. Here we go. So here's the uh, crawl space. Now we put this black down just to keep the construction debris off of our basement concrete slab. So that's just a protection layer for construction that will get removed later. But now you can see here's the beams, uh, or uh, yes, here's the beams that are gonna run on top of the piers right here. And what you're seeing here is that grid work is then gonna get filled in with, in this case, eye joists. Now, once the eye joists are in place, because this is a conditioned crawl space, we're gonna run the perimeter uh, of the floor. And on that perimeter, we're running inch and an eighth at Vantec. And you're gonna see why we only did the perimeter here in just a moment. Now, here's that inch and eighth at Vantec right there. And you can see what we're doing now is we're forming that short basement by putting two inches of closed cell spray polyurethane foam on the whole outside perimeter of this conditioned crawl space. So now that short basement is gonna be air conditioned and I don't need any insulation in the floor line because it's just gonna be on the perimeter of this house. So now we're ready to go into framing. Now that that's complete, we can finish that floor and move from there up. But in this case, now we've got a pier and beam with a conditioned crawl space. Okay, now let's take a look at the other type, which is an unconditioned crawl space. This is a house that we did a couple years ago that's a modern farmhouse style. In fact, I credit this house with starting the modern farmhouse movement. But uh, this is a house where the owners said to us, we're really interested in the potential of being able to move this house. They had moved from a country farm that had a house moved onto that site. And they said, look, we wanna build a new house on this farm site. This is actually the Springdale Farms house here in Austin, Texas. And we may in the future need to change the way the land is used and we wanna be able to move the house either within our current property or someday if we sold the land, we might want to actually move this house off the property. And that's where a pier and beam house absolutely shines. So here's the underside of this house. Now this is, a, this is going to be a traditional vented crawl space. So here you can see our piers right here and you can see daylight from this photo. I'm under the house looking underneath the house and we just have piers and beam intersections. And then in this case, we use the more traditional lumber. We actually have two by tens and two by twelves for beams and for floor joists in here. So this is a much more traditionally framed house. Really this, this house built 
uh, I guess we finished this six or seven years ago, is built the same way houses might have been built in the 1950s in Austin, Texas. With the addition or the change that underneath that crawl space, we used closed cell foam and sprayed it up underneath the floor joists and sprayed the whole underside of the house. Here's the finished house now that it's done. Now, what is it about these houses that I like, pier and beams? There's several things. I like that pier and beam houses are easier to insulate. Slab on grade houses really can't be insulated very easily. There's some perimeter insulation you might use. There's a few other tricky ways, but pier and beams on the other hand, much, much either easier to insulate. Either we can do an unconditioned crawl space and insulate the perimeter of our short basement, or we can spray foam underneath that. There's also bat insulation that could be used. It's a little bit harder to get it right, but in general, much easier to insulate, and now you've got a fully insulated floor. The other thing I really like about pier and beam houses is they're much easier to fix, repair, upgrade, and remodel. Remember that picture I had at my friend's house? This is the one that had the no P-trap. You can see that pipe there was connected to that, no P-trap super hard to diagnose the problem. It's not like we could get under the house and have a look. Whereas if this was a pier and beam house, we could have crawled under there to really see what we were getting into. We could have fixed it same day, really. In this case, we had to demo all the tile. We had to get rid of the concrete. Huge amount of work to do it. Much, much harder to diagnose. Much harder to repair, to remodel, and to upgrade. Another big benefit of pier and beam houses is they're actually easier on your feet. I'm saying that from my concrete slab here that I'm talking to you at my shop. But if you stand on concrete all day long, you'll notice that your joints feel tired. There's no give on that concrete. So you're relying on your shoes and that cushioning in your shoes to cushion that. But when you've got a pier and beam house, that wood has a little bit of give. So as you walk, the floor flexes just a little bit. Now you don't want it to flex so much that you're shaking your grandmother's china cabinet when you walk by, but believe it or not, there is a difference on your feet and standing all day long on a pier and beam house versus a slab house, I guarantee you're gonna notice the difference. And the other thing that I mentioned earlier, much, much easier to move that house someday if we want to. This farmhouse, as I mentioned, that has this pier and beam, if that client wants to move that someday, all they're gonna have to do is cut all the plumbing off cut the connections between the concrete piers and the wood framing, slide some eye joists under there and jack those up and literally that house could be moved on a semi and put on another location anywhere in Texas or anywhere in the world for that matter because you literally could pick the house up. You cannot do that with a slab on grade house. You're, you're very, very limited when it comes to remodel time. Guys, thanks for joining me on this deep dive on foundations. As you can see, I really like pier and beam foundations However, there are times when slabs are absolutely the right choice. It's going to depend a lot on your conditions, on your soil, on what the engineers say. So definitely get a soils engineer involved so you know what the ground is that you're putting your house on. And you want to consult your structural engineer as well as your builder before you build these. You don't want somebody who's never built one of these foundations before. They're only doing this one type and you're forcing them to do a different type. But if you have the options, as you can see, I really like pier and beam houses and I like them with a conditioned crawl space underneath. Guys, if you're not already a subscriber, hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.